Hi everyone, this is Bai Ling. As you know me from a lot of movies, especially The Crow. And please watch Horror Squad podcast. Back to the Horror Squad podcast, episode number 277. Tonight, we're talking about my birthday pick, House of a Thousand Corpses, Rob Zombie's film. I'm one of your co host Todd. We have Joe and we have Steven. I take it we have an interview tonight, right, gentlemen? We do. Could we have? Could we have? Uh, so, Joe and I interviewed the legendary Bai Ling. She's been in a ton of movies, including The Crow, Exorcism at 60,000 Feet. And a bunch of other things, like a lot of mainstream things too, like Wild Wild West and um, Samurai Cop Two, and there's a there's a bunch of Star Wars at one point, but she got apparently cut because she did Playboy. Hey, it's a whole thing. Uh, super interesting. Crank one. high voltage, right? Crank high voltage. So yeah, so she's uh, interviewing for a movie called Johnny and Clyde, which we uh, are going to talk about on What Watch. So stick around to the end. It's uh, it's a good interview. It's very revealing. Yes. <laughs> nice. Very, very pleasant woman. Very. I look forward very, to very listening pleasant. to it. I look forward to listening to myself. But Todd, yes. happy birthday, buddy! Again, thank you. Thank uh, you. What'd you do yeah. for your birthday? I got a big, uh, big night done. Was Friday? Thursday was my birthday, the fourth. You know, just did normal dad stuff. I mean, I had to do orthodontics appointment in the morning. So like, <laughs> it never stops, man. When you're yeah, kids. Made myself some burgers. I love burgers. I'm a burger guy, and I'm getting really good at like grilling them to, to perfection i'll fucking grill you guys some burgers come over we'll, we'll, we'll light them up get some melted cheese on there we'll get yeah, some right. slightly toasted well no you like them plain though you little freak i do <laughs> this, this is just for joe then i'll load joe's up joe's burger up then on friday i went to reds game since i'm close to cincinnati and we watched them get beat by the uh, chicago white Sox. but it was a good game it's a lot of a lot of offense a lot of home runs sat right on the on the wall in uh, center field there no home runs came my way uh, but i was ready i had my glove and uh, that's about it you guys been up to? Um, not much for me, really. It's been, I guess, uneventful. So, yeah, I don't know, Steve. Anything good going on with you? Yeah, uh, I did something super fun, and Todd was there as well uh, for the kind of second half of it. But a bunch of us from the Discord, which I can't talk enough good things about, actually hung out on Xbox and played Dead by Daylight for like four or five hours. And we had a friggin' blast. I mean, Dead by Daylight, for those who don't know, is kind of a horror game where you play uh, four survivors versus one killer. It has a ton of, like, real kind of horror legends. You know, you have Ghostface, you have Leatherface, you have uh, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, a uh, bunch of other ones from different franchises. So You can play as Laurie Strode, Survivor. Yeah, exactly. You can play as Laurie Strode, you can play as Ash. You, there's a bunch of cool survivors as well. And we just had a blast. I mean... I don't think the game is that great, if I'm being honest, but playing with a bunch of like friends essentially was just cool. And we had so much fun and laughing and yeah, it was a good time. Yeah, I think that's about the fourth game night we've hosted. And um, usually it's Friday 13th. We do some Halo. This is the first Dead by Daylight. And I agree, the game is like actually not good. <laughs> like I don't like it at all. But playing in the group, though, definitely saves it. So yeah, come to Discord. If you got Xbox, we'll play. If you got PC Game Pass, we'll play. Man, it's it's a really good time. Yeah, and speaking of the Discord, uh, just so everyone knows, our next movie night is going to be Saturday, uh, May 20th. So that's both uh, different than what we usually do, because it's usually last Friday of the month. But I will be in Texas with uh, Joe. And uh, so we're doing it on a Saturday, and we're going to be watching Pope's Exorcist, which is actually something we're going to review in two weeks. So uh, if you want to join, again, Discord, amazing group of people. And yeah, so let's get into it. How about uh, we start with a little bit of tea? Oh, you want the tea? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We don't serve tea. Nope. Instead, you get a cup of Joe. And now here's Joe with the news. So yeah, let's get into it. Here is your cup of Joe. A cup of hard Joe news for the week. Love it. File this one under Joe is absolutely coming. Because, ladies and gentlemen, they just announced Again? the Blair Witch Project is coming back, ladies and gentlemen. That is right. Lionsgate is developing a new installment in the Blair Witch Project franchise. Currently, not a lot of info out there. Uh, besides that, Oliver Park has been hired to direct the currently untitled Blair Witch 
sequel. Uh, you might know him from last year's The Offering. Uh, he's also done movies, uh, Strange Events Still, and A Night of Horror, Nightmare Radio. Uh, so on particular note here, the production company attached is Hacks and Films, which of course was the original originator of the original Blair Witch Project. Also, Dan Miriak and Eduardo Sanchez have been listed as producers. So it seems like we are going to get the original gang back together, which hasn't happened since the very first Blair Witch Project. So it seems like we are heading in the right direction and we are going to get a legitimate maybe sequel to the original with, you know, the originals, obviously a lot of stuff with Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows, uh, you know, the uh, Jawara Sanchez absolutely hates that movie, uh, really had nothing to do with it. So I'm excited, I think, with him coming back and stuff like that, I I think the franchise is going to be on the right track again. So uh, what do you guys think about this? Yeah, bring it on, man. I mean, the Blair Witch from like, what, 2016-ish? pulled like 45 mil on a five mil budget. So like, I don't know why we haven't had one for the song. So yeah. Yeah. If, if they have a good idea, then I'm definitely in uh, the Blair Witch lore is really cool. So I'm hoping that they can expand on it and uh, give us something kind of familiar, but fresh at the same time. So um, I, I definitely watch it. And it's nice that they're actually advertising it as Blair Witch this time. Cause last time it was a surprise. It was called the forest, I think, or something like that. Right up Something until like release, that, the right? Woods or some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they swapped they, it. It was like a surprise uh, drop, kind of like they did with um, Cloverfield, uh, one uh, that they dropped the, like the out, of, out of nowhere. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, looking forward to it. All righty. Well, some sort of file this one under, I guess, a bit of bad news here for you Stranger Things fans, as we're already going to have to wait a little while. For Stranger Things, the final season. Well, you have to wait even longer now because of the ongoing writer strike. Uh, it is putting a halt to a lot of productions right now. And the biggest one right now, obviously, being Stranger Things. They were set to begin filming pretty soon, actually, from my understanding. But now it is completely on hold. Uh, the Duffer Brothers wrote a statement on Twitter. They said, uh, writing does not stop when filming begins. While we're excited to start production with our amazing cast and crew, it is not possible during this strike. We hope a fair deal is reached soon so we can all get back to work. Until then, over and out. So obviously, uh, you know, just this weekend, actually, the MTV Movie Awards suffered a, a big thing where they were supposed to have a live show. They ended up pivoting to a uh, pre-taped show, which I didn't watch. Drew Barrymore actually was supposed to host. She ended up dropping out due to the writer's strike because they threatened to pick it. So yeah, it's kind of a mess out there right now. And I'm sure a lot more productions are going to suffer because of this. So hopefully, you know, we can, they can strike a deal soon and yeah, we'll see what happens. All right. So next bit of news here is Evil Dead Rise. For those of you who are not able to see it in theaters, the movie just came out, what, two or three weeks ago? Well, as of this recording, you can already watch it at home. Uh, this is going to be like one of the quickest turnarounds I can remember in, po you know, post-COVID, essentially. I mean, obviously during COVID, uh, the height of COVID, they were releasing movies same day as theaters and whatnot because no one was going to the theaters. And now here we are. I mean, it is hitting VOD. Like I said, right, it's already out right now and is going to hit 4K and Blu-ray uh, next month. So I, what do you guys think? Do you think this is good for business i actually think it's maybe a little too fast if i'm being honest i do like that it's fast you know like i don't want to wait three four months before the vod between theater because there's like this mid space where it's not playing anywhere you just can't see it for a long time but this is a little too quick like it just passed 100 million like a few days ago i saw that article and then all of a sudden it's already on vod like try to at least get as much you know theater time as possible before and then put it out on VOD. So I am for quick releases. I just think this one, it might be a little too quick if uh, you ask me, because eventually people are going to get wise and start say, well, I'm not going to watch it in theater because it'll come out in like three, four weeks on VOD anyway. And I mean, that that's a good way to go too. But if they're, if you're looking at a money perspective, I don't see how this makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I like, it just like, I don't think theaters will ever, fully die 
But I feel like this is like sort of the beginning of maybe the end for them because like if you're gonna start releasing stuff this quickly or same same day as theaters, like what's the point? I mean, obviously, like a theater experience is a lot different than seeing it at home. But still, like people aren't gonna go out and spend forty to fifty. It's expensive to go to the movies, forty or fifty bucks. You know, after you buy the tickets for you know this is for two people, you buy the tickets, then you, obviously you're gonna get you know some popcorn and a soda. It ends up costing you about fifty bucks. Why do that when you can watch it at home for a lot cheaper and even more cheaper because you know a lot of people are pirating these movies for completely free. So yeah, I don't think it makes any sense either, Steve. And I, I mean, I think they should at least be waiting a, a month to two and not, you know, two weeks after release. I mean, obviously Renfield Pope's Exorcist as well, which we're going to be covering because they released them so quick. So thank you for that. That's great for the podcast. Maybe not so great for business, but I mean, obviously they think a lot of money is to be made at home. Obviously, people are staying home, not going to theaters. So I guess we'll see. I mean, you know, within the next maybe 20, 30 years, could we see maybe one theater within a 50 mile radius of your house because all the other ones are dead? I think it's quite possible. All right. Next big news here is Beetlejuice 2. Is it finally going to happen, folks? It really seems like it is going to. You know, it's been teased since of course the the first movie came out you know almost 30 years ago or over 30 years ago now but of course jenna ortega very heavily rumored to be starring in this uh, alongside michael keaton who has supposedly already signed on and tim burton coming back to direct well a very important piece has also said he is coming back as well as composer danny elfman has said he is definitely um in talks and plans on composing Beetlejuice 2. So, I mean, what do you I mean, what do you think this is finally going to happen, right? I really don't care, honestly. <laughs> like it's been so long and I love Michael Keaton, but like um Jenna Ortega, she's fantastic, but let's like not oversaturate her, you know what I mean? Like they always do with every hot actor. And going back to the movie theater thing, like I will never pay 19.99 to fucking rent a movie. So, um yeah, fuck that. But uh yeah, as for Beetlejuice, like I don't know. Like Steve said earlier about Blair Witch, if they have a great story, let's do it. But other than that, it's like, it's a long, it's been a long time. You know, is, is it going to have the same magic? I, I highly doubt it. Yeah, you know what? I, usually I'd agree with you, Todd, but seeing uh, Michael Keaton in the Batman suit, despite not liking Ezra Miller, made me excited for that movie because Michael Keaton is just like one of those really special actors. So I think if someone could pull it off this far out from the uh, original, I think it could be him. Uh, so if the right people are involved, there's the right script, and Michael Keaton, you know, he's, he's, he seems to have not lost his touch. So I, I definitely go see it. So I'm, I'm kind of excited. It's just, I'm also skeptical because how many times have we heard Beetlejuice 2 is coming or very close and it just didn't happen. So until I see like a behind the scenes, you know, set photo, I'm still reluctant to believe it. Is a, I'm, I'm sorry, did you mention if Baldwin's coming back or not? No, I don't think anything about him right now. Obviously, or, or you know, Davis. he was he, he was just finally exonerated, yeah. you know, for his charges. So that might maybe progress his role. You know, I would like to see them both back. You know, they're yeah. very important characters to that. Are they necessary, though? I think you could do it without them. You know, as long as you get Winona, Ryder, and uh, Michael Keaton back, I think. And Jenna supposedly is supposed to play Winona's daughter. I think that's good enough, but I think, uh, you know, they were such integral part of that original movie. I think it would be great for them to come back as well. So I'd we'll like see. to see uh, Catherine O'Hara back too. I think that would yeah, be nice because she's, she's great. Uh, I would have loved to have seen the dad too, but yeah. No, no. Fuck him. Yeah, no. Forget him. <laughs> He's a creeper. So we he, he and Ed Gale could go rot somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and Otho just passed away like within yeah. the last five years Did or he? something. So unfortunately, yeah. we won't see him back. Speaking, uh, speaking of Ed Gale, his Instagram is still up, and I was just curious. Oof. People are lighting him up. I'm mean, rightfully so, rightfully so. But yeah, he he kept it up for some damn reason. Yeah, that's oof. <laughs> go back to our last new segment. You'll if you don't know the whole Ed Gale, Gale story, and you'll learn something there. Uh, all right, uh, the next bit of news here is the Conjuring franchise. Uh, of course, we are going to be getting the fourth movie in the franchise. Well. We got a title, ladies and gentlemen. The next movie is going to be called The Conjuring Last Rites. Now, better than The Devil Made Me Do It, 
I would say, right? <laughs> um, but I mean, as far as anything else, uh, nothing else out there as far as what the story is going to be or anything like that. I'm sure Patrick Wilson, Briar Farmiga, of course, will be coming back. Nothing else confirmed as of now, though. So that's all I can tell you. The Conjuring Last Rites sounds like it's going to be some sort of maybe exorcism type movie or something, but we shall see. R I T E S. Yes. It would have been cooler if it was the other one. <laughs> they could just probably <laughs> throw us off guard. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The last one was like left such a foul taste, you know, after the part one and two being so amazing. It sucks. So hopefully they write the ship. Yeah. Well, and another one, Exorcist the Believer. How do we how do we feel about that Ooh, title? No, that's lame. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't I agree. I don't have I... any faith in anything those guys do anymore. Yeah, I mean David Gordon Green, man. He, I hope, I hope he writes the shit, man. I, I really do. I, I, but we'll see. I mean, after what he did to Halloween, say some people loved Halloween that for that trilogy. So you know, maybe yeah. he can I mean, do something. I like that first one. You know, <laughs> so yeah, you know, maybe the first Exorcist will be good, and then he'll ruin it. So who knows? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll definitely see. Steve also want to throw this out to you. Disney's Haunted Mansion, PG thirteen rating. It's pretty good, right? For like a kids movie. Yeah, I mean that's as good as you're gonna get for uh, you know an attraction at a at a Disney park, I guess. But um, I, I'm you know I'm cautiously optimistic about it. So I'm, I don't know though. I'm still kind of on the fence. I don't think the trailers look very good, but maybe those low expectations might help me out when it comes out in July. Yeah, we'll definitely see. Uh, for you horror collectors and Halloween collectors out there, Spirit has just announced that they are going to be releasing a six foot cotton candy cocoon this season from killer clowns from outer space. Pretty cool. Trick or treat, trick or treat studios released one a long time ago. That one's not very good. I am hoping this one might be a little better, but we'll see. Um, it'll definitely be in stores. So check it out for you killer clowns fans. And finally tonight, I wanted to touch on this because Blade Disgusting released a thing of 29 horror movies you don't want to miss this summer. I'm not going to list, list all 29, don't worry about it, but I did want to touch on a few of the major ones that is going to be coming. Uh, the num- first one I want to mention is May 26th, coming to theaters. Todd's favorite. Becky 2, The Wrath oh, of Man, Becky. I thought you were going to say like Saw or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no more Becky, please. I'm into it. I'm ready. I, I mean, I thought the first one was pretty good, and uh, I think they can improve on it. So uh, I'm, I'm digging it. Uh, the next one here is one that is highly anticipated, uh, mainly because they supposedly, you know, take this with a grain of salt, because you know how the studios love to do this. But they supposedly had to recut parts of this movie because it was so scary. And this is based on Stephen King's short story. The movie is called The Boogeyman, which will be hitting theaters on June 2nd. I, do you guys know? I didn't have a trailer for this or anything. No, but that's so stupid. You, you're going to tell me <laughs> in like a test screening or whatever. They're like, hey, Adolf, man, this movie's really hitting. Everyone's super scared. I know, dude. We got to cut it. We got to cut the scares down. It's too scary. No, they don't do that. They're recutting because it sucks. They, they'll cut gore, obviously, to make the MPA happy. But scares? No, come on. Any any time scares are mentioned in the marketing, I immediately think to myself, this is not going to be good. You know, there was a time when audiences being scared was a kind of a, something attractive to me. But now it's like, no, this is stupid marketing. It just let, let a movie speak for itself. And the, the great example of that is Terrifier 2, right? They took actual people like fainting and shit and then ran with it as opposed to coming out with that before the movie was even out. So. Yeah, it's going to suck, I bet. Man, you know what's really scary is like when you hear a cat puking in the middle of the night, you don't know where she puked at. It could be anywhere. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so let's get some like fucking real life stuff like you uh, do your taxes, you owe money, shit like that. <laughs> All righty. Well, the next one we got July 7th, the highly anticipated Insidious, The Red Door. I am very excited for this one. Uh, next up, we have July 28th, The Haunted Mansion. Steve, I know, very excited for that one. Here's one I'm really excited about. A24's Talk to Me comes out July 28th. It's got the possessed hand. Steve doesn't look excited. He's making a so, face. So I'm going to be honest with you. This, to me, is like this year's, you know, like the every we talk about all the time, the generic 
story that is just gonna we had a couple examples like um uh, the one the year before truth or dare was the other one i was thinking about uh megan was kind of in that same vein it seemed the trailer just gave me generic vibes you know it's just i don't know i hope i'm wrong a24 you know it could be hit and miss so we'll see what it's like what do you guys think about this one meg to the trench hitting theaters august 4th interesting yeah currently they're talking about it on our discord but i yeah i'm not a huge fan in the first one it's pretty goofy and i like rain wilson in it and jason Statham does fine the trench actually is a book i wonder if they're going to base it off this book this time because i really like the book so i guess we'll wait and see yeah i'm actually excited for this um i like a good shark movie you know i've seen so many bad ones that to have one with actual budget and stuff i think is uh pretty cool i like the meg i don't love the meg but i liked it and I, I could see them having fun with the second one. So I'm down. All right. Well, September 8th, Steve, get out the lube because we have the nun too. Oh yeah. I'm ready. I am so fucking ready. I really hope that it's good because I didn't love the last nun movie. And I hope that they correct uh, kind of the ship on that. I, I haven't heard, I haven't seen anything about the nun too, though, other than it's coming out. So I'm a little concerned. Like there's nothing coming out from that production that I've heard, which is odd. Uh, but who knows? Maybe they're just so excited about it that they're keeping it under like Marvel type. It's too uh, scary. They had to <laughs> type it back. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I can't wait though. It's <laughs> hopefully it's fun. Yeah, the Are first you planning one, on man, all, all, all style, no no substance. Exactly. Yeah. Planning on meeting uh, Bonnie Aarons at Texas Frightmare? I know she's gonna be there. Uh, I I have her autograph like a couple times already, so I'm not uh, gonna get her autograph. But I'll definitely go like you know walk by that table, <laughs> catch a glimpse, <laughs> and, yeah, do, do an awkward wave. <laughs> 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 Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's about that's it. So that's it for the summer. And then, of course, the fall is going to be loaded with, of course, Saw, The Exorcist, uh, amongst many others. I'm, I can't even think of right now. So it's it's going to even though right now we've been saying this year hasn't been great. There's a lot of great stuff still to come. So yeah, hopefully the, this year this, picks up. This year needs to get better. Like this year <laughs> is really bad so far. I mean, there's some good stuff. There's some really good stuff so far, but. I can't wait for the second half of the year and hopefully get some of those heavy hitters in. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's it for hard news this week, ladies and gentlemen, or your cup of Joe this week. So thank you. Well, speaking of cup of Joe, there's only one place. Well, I guess two places now that you can get a cup of Joe. Now there's with our friends, Deadly Ground Coffee. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. There's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds coffee is my guilty pleasure. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. What well, watch? Alrighty, sure. Um, I have zero. So you guys take it over. All right, I'll start us off then. I have, well, we're going to talk about Johnny and Clyde at the end here because we got our interview with Bai Ling. Make sure you stick around for that at the end of the episode. Uh, but the first one I got tonight is The Price We Pay. This one, uh, I believe, is a 2023 release. It stars Emil Hirsch and Stephen Dorff. Uh, so this one is about, you know, they're kind of a ragtag group. They, uh, end up robbing a pawn shop. Um, the robbery sort of goes wrong. They end up having to take uh, a woman hostage. They get in her car. Uh, the car ends up breaking down, so they end up walking. They find a farmhouse, and they've stumbled into the wrong farmhouse because it is a group of maniacs. You've heard this story before. You know, overall, it's, it's not great. But it gets a lot better at the end. Like, it was like, it was very generic. I actually was, I liked how it started, you know, sort of the, you know, there was like some good action scenes with the robbery and stuff like that. And Steven Dorff and Emil Hirsch, do, you know, they're pretty uh, good acting wise here. But then, man, like the middle is just like really just generic. And the character, like the psycho characters are just boring. They're not really all that interesting. But man, then the third act, it really picks up and the practical effects are really fucking good um, towards the end of the movie. So 
you know, it's not something I would recommend, but you could do a lot worse. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's like a fine, maybe one time watch at best good, like laundry movie to not something like to not pay attention to, but you see some cool shit, some cool kills towards the end. So yeah, I gave it a, a two and a half out of five over on Letterboxd. So my first one this week is one we talked about briefly last week. Joe had said that it was the talk of the town over in Salem at Salem Horror Fest. So I was really curious to check it out. And that is Saint Drogo, which is a 2023 film. This movie is about a gay couple. And one of them is having nightmares about his ex-boyfriend. So they decide to go to um, province town, Cape Cod, for like a vacation, but off-season. And then they realize that the ex-boyfriend is actually missing. So it becomes kind of a uh, search of the ex-boyfriend to see if they can find him and what happened to him and stuff like that. And the more they dig into what happened to him, the uh, more they get into this crazy cult thing that's happening in this town when they're off season. I'll be honest with you. So I, I went on, I, on IMD, on Letterboxd. And this thing has nothing lower than a three and a half star out of five. So I was really excited about it. But I'll be honest, me personally, the first hour of it, I was I was bored. Um, there's just not a lot going on. I thought the dialogue was really bad. The acting was spotty at best. And I wasn't really digging it. I was like at a one out of five for the majority of it. But the last 10-ish minutes are fantastic. That's where you get a lot of the horror. That's where you get into really the meat and potatoes of the uh, cult and all that stuff. And that part was like really awesome. In fact, there's a good chance. Uh, there's a lot of movie left in this year. But right now, there's a good chance that it has probably my favorite kill of the year. Because there's a kill in this that was seriously... I don't know how they did it. That's how fucking good it looked. It was really really well done and gory and hell i think they put their whole budget honestly in that one kill because the rest of the movie was made kind of very low budget so yeah so that definitely saved the movie a lot for me so i gave it two and a half stars out of five uh, i'm not sure when it's going to come out it didn't say in the press release but i'm assuming it'll be on vod sometime this year it's funny though because so I gave two and a half out of five. That would put me as the lowest score on uh, Letterboxd. And I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so I'm actually holding my reviews. So I'm not that guy. <laughs> uh, but that's my honest opinion of it. I do say it's worth checking out. I will give you a warning, though. Don't watch this on your phone in public. Because there is a lot of sex in this movie. Like a really crazy amount of sex in this movie. It's just nonstop. And yeah. All right. We get some male dong in there. Male uh, dong no, there, there's no nudity in it actually. <laughs> All right, <laughs> uh, but there, there's a lot of simulated mm. uh, sex from okay. a lot of men. I think the whole cast are gay men. So, mm -hmm. I, uh, man, I I'll never forget coming back. I think it was from a Texas Frightmare weekend, and I watched The Shining on the plane on the ride home. And the lady, it was like an old lady next to me, and like the bathtub scene came on when like she's just like full. The woman's like fully nude. You see like full bush and everything. I was like, so I felt so awkward. You know, the breasts used to look like that, honey. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Joe, when you got an so airplane awkward. to Texas Frightmare, you need to just cover up and like not watch anything because apparently <laughs> oh, I know, always, right? you always scare your neighbor. <laughs> I do. I do. So, rem <laughs> yeah, remember that in two weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> I'll, I'm sure I'll have another story eventually. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, all right. Uh, the last one I get tonight, I know Steve's going to jump in on this, is Johnny and Clyde. Stars our interview tonight by Ling. Also stars Megan Fox, as well as Ivan Yogia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, he's, was he from Steve? You said he's from something yeah, pretty he, popular. Yeah, he played uh, Leon Kennedy in uh, Resident Evil, the like latest Resident Evil movie. Gotcha. All right. Uh, so yeah, Johnny and Clyde is about, you know, obviously kind of uh, play off of Bonnie and Clyde, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have now Johnny and Clyde who are essentially the same type of thing. They're bad people. They're bank robbers and just all around just causing mischief. One day they try to knock off a armored vehicle 
what they come to find out is that this armored vehicle doesn't have as much money as they thought in it. They were getting ready to kill uh, the guy when he says, wait, 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 you want money? I know a place where you can get a lot of money. And he go proceeds to tell them about this sort of secret bank, you know, for lack of a better word, vault, where all of essentially the dirty money is kept from the casino that is run by Megan Fox. She is sort of our Terry Benedict, Ocean's Eleven's t- uh, type villain in this one. Not as good uh, of an actor, though, as uh, Andy Garcia. Um, but so basically, Johnny and Clyde find out that, hey, we can you know knock this place off and get a ton of money. So they end up, what they do is they get this sort of rag, they get this ragtag group together to knock this bank off. But little do they know that Megan Fox has something up her sleeves. She has a satanic cult and a demon that can she, she ends up getting the satanic cult. She gets this satanic cult leader to summon a demon to to protect her bank vault. And I'll leave it at that. And that, you know, yeah, I mean, this movie sounds really interesting. But it's really fucking terrible. I was on the edge of my seat every time you describe something. You you freaking one up yourself. So like, I'm, in, I'm in. I mean, in theory, it sounds actually really cool and interesting. Um, but man, it's just like really low, low, low hanging fruit here. You know, it's like very. It's I blame a lot of it. I think on the director. Honestly, I, I think. Oh, and the writing, I guess. I mean, because I, I think like there's very capable actors here, you know, Megan Fox. And I think the, honestly, I think the standout is uh, Johnny and Clyde. Like, I think they both give really good performances. Megan Fox performance, not very good at all. Um, she is super wooden in this, very robotic. I think this is sort of just like a get the paycheck and, and run type movie for her. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating because I do think there was potential for a good movie here. But as it sits, it's just a complete fucking mess. Um, I think the demon, Basqua, I believe is his name that they summon. He's really fucking cool looking. Sort of like a Grim Reaper sort of skeleton thing. But he's just like really like underutilized and just pretty much out of place. Because like the majority of this movie is not a horror movie. Um, and he's really the only part of the movie that is horror. And we get him in the last like 10, 15 minutes. So this movie definitely has an identity crisis um, for sure. You know, I... Gave it a one and a half out of five over on Letterboxd. I said it was basically the Wish version of the Suicide Squad, and I stand by it. <laughs> you don't think this movie has an identity, uh, Joe? On IMDb, it's listed as an action, crime, drama, adventure, thriller, horror. <laughs> so take that. <laughs> uh, yeah, this movie doesn't fucking know what it wants to be. It's just like, let's make a movie about anything we want to and just throw it in together and pump something out uh, i agree with a lot with, of what joe said it's it's so random i mean first of all there's not one likable character in this and that's a problem if you're if you don't know who the hell you're rooting for you're you're kind of watching a movie like i don't really care what happens and they just their answer to everything to everything in this movie is i'll kill i'll kill the other character it's just people dying the whole movie. Like everyone freaking dies in this movie. Like it's just I'll kill this person, I'll kill that person, I'll kill that. It's just the weirdest thing. Like they don't keep characters for more than five minutes because they kill them off constantly. You know, it's it's the weirdest thing. Oh, I don't like the way you made my coffee. Dead. Oh, uh, you know, you looked at me wrong. Dead. It's just it's the weirdest fucking movie. There were some scenes that were cool. The horror elements were actually pretty cool. But it was like someone said, no, no, we need some horror in there to make sure that we have that as one of our genres you know so they just threw this whole thing in that made no sense whatsoever but it did look kind of cool yeah this movie's a mess um i also gave it one and a half stars because there were some entertaining scenes that it's just super random i mean they're taking drugs like 200 pills <laughs> you know they just stuff it in their mouth they like snort cocaine like it's friggin you know like sugar it's it's the weird like they'd be dead on site it's just what a weird movie yeah, I don't know. I don't know who this was made for. Well, 303 people on IMDb agreed with you guys. It's a 2.4 out of 10 on there. So That's, a, that's high, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's good 2.1 on Letterboxd. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So my last one this week is a 2017 film that I watched over on Tubi. 
and it's called Toxic Tutu. I just saw the name and I'm like, I got to watch this. I don't even know what it's about. It's a ridiculous name. I, I felt in a rid- ridiculous mood that day and I decided, fuck it, I'll just check it out. But reading into it before I started watching it, I realized, okay, wait, this is about the guy who played uh, Toxie in The Toxic Avenger. And apparently he hasn't been doing cons for a long time. And all of a sudden he started appearing for cons. So they made kind of a story as to what happened in the 30 years that he wasn't doing cons and kind of cataloging in a mockumentary style, his return to conventions. And that's basically what the film's about. Of course, it's a trauma film, you know, as so it's got a lot of trauma elements. I thought it would be interesting, especially that it starts off kind of a mockumentary. You see all the different cons he goes to. But this movie gets super fucking weird and complete nonsense. I don't even know what the hell I saw. It's just cut together pieces of footage that they took from, you know, a few conventions with some kind of story that they tried to splice into it. The most random friggin' cameos you've ever seen. Like, they just have these really random people show up just to come in. Jake to Snake Roberts. There's a... I don't even remember who they are because I was like just so out of it. Uh, I didn't enjoy this at all. And I, I like trauma stuff, but this was just way too fucking weird for my taste. It just didn't come off good at all. And uh, I gave it a half star. I just, it was too weird. There, there's just a limit to my weirdness. And this wasn't <laughs> there's good. a limit to your weirdness. Got yeah. it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it is, is, is there any part of the film that is truth? Like, does it start as a documentary? Like, um, ah, what's the one about Troll 2 that's excellent? Where that's about that, you know, Fable production. Is it kind of like that? I think the idea came that he just wasn't doing cons. Mm -hmm. um, Probably just because he wasn't interested. And then he saw that, you know, there's money into it. So that's probably what he did. Um, And then they kind of brought the tutu into it, which is the original tutu he was wearing in the original Toxic Adventure. So that whole thing. And they just made a movie out of it. And it's not good. It's it's it like it, like I told you. There's a bunch of cameos. The way they t- tried to shoehorn in the, those cameos into the story was just a, like you go into you have to go into a wrestling ring to make sure that they can get DDT'd by Jake the Snake. But why? You know, just why not? Right? They're just happened to be there at that convention. I think they just took people who were at that con doing signings and just kind of like, hey, you want to be. You know, two minute cameo in my movie, and I'm like, sure. Interesting. It's Lloyd Kaufman, right now, right? I would. <laughs> like, fuck, <laughs> fuck, yeah, I would. So. Yeah. Oh, Lloyd Kaufman directed this? Yeah. I, did, oh, I don't boy. know if he directed it, but uh, probably. No, he didn't direct it. Joe Nardelli, Nardelli did, but this was, he was all, all over it. He was in the movie. It's Toxie, it. of course, right? So, right. yeah. Cool. Not recommended. Just watch Toxic Adventure again. <laughs> all right. I think it's time for trivia. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Quarter number two is as follows. Myself, Todd, and Leva, 17. Joe in second place with 12. Steve, third, nine. This is game like number six or seven. Who would like to lead off today? I'll lead us off. I have a theme tonight. Oh, oh is I won't it, tell uh, it's, it's probably <laughs> Rob Zombie. So. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah, shocker. <laughs> All right. So Rob we have like seven Zombie movies to theme. pick from. Let's go. Right. Okay. <laughs> So, question number one. What hobby does Michael develop in the sanitarium? Crochet, um, paper mache. Yeah. Yeah, I I'll, I'll give it to you. That's, that's right. I'll give it. I was, what I was is saying, it? What would you call it? I, say, I put, he, he learns to make masks. Oh, well, paper mache. Paper mache. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I out, of paper, out of paper mache. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll give it to you. And Danny Trejo did not deserve to die in that movie. He's a man with a heart of gold in that film. Mm-hmm. Bastard and Michael. He, <laughs> it, it was an important scene, though. I know, I guess. Mikey, I was good to you, Mikey. <laughs> Makes me cry every time. All right. I also have a theme tonight, if you can Ooh. guess what it is. <laughs> it's Rob also Zombie. Rob Zombie, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <right. laughs> All right. Captain Spaulding's murder ride. There are four serial killers named in the murder ride. I want them in order. Ooh. In order? Okay. Yes. Uh, Albert order Fish. Okay. Ed Gain. Incorrect. Shit. I want another try after it. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, Albert Fish. Yep. And then. 
<laughs> I know the last one is Doctor Satan. Well, don't say it. Then, I'm gonna. I, I know yeah. who the two are. So, and then I, I think you guys are gonna miss a key uh, person here. That is, but I'm not gonna give any more of that. Go, Steve. Okay, so getting to go over. Yeah. Or, yeah. Go. Jody, okay. So yeah. Albert Fish, uh-huh. Lizzie Borden, Ed Gein, and then Doctor Satan. Correct. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lizzie Borden's only said by Jerry. Yeah. Mm. Not uh, Captain Spaulding. I, I I I just didn't remember the order. <laughs> All right, you know what time it is. It's mm. your favorite time of the week. Mm, yeah, that's right. So sex and nudity, the, baby. That's right. Guess the movie based off the IMDb rental guide. And guess what? Oh, no theme tonight because I oh. I knew you guys would probably go with Rob Zombie, so I didn't <laughs> want to do the same thing. All right, A little bonus this time. Two. Sex and nudity ones because I couldn't decide oh, which one to do. <laughs> okay. Sex and nudity. It is implied that a man hid cameras in a woman's bathroom. Also, a woman says to her boss, You bang Susan in the warehouse. <laughs> hmm. Happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, violence and gore. A man's head is shredded by a lawnmower of sorts. You see uh, some sort of chunky blood splat onto his face and a chunk of his head shoot out the end. That's cool. Oh, you want to guess or you want to risk it? No, I mean, I I, I can picture this. The scene, I just can't think of the movie right now. (laughs) This one made me laugh. So I put it in profanity. There are two slang uses of ginger. (laughs) No. (laughs) I don't know why that was a profanity, but it made me laugh. Well, then. Alcohol, drugs, and smoking. Two guys are outside. One guy asks the other guy for a lighter. He starts to light a cigarette and about to smoke, but is interrupted. Mm. And finally, frightening intense scenes. A man's mother gets killed in a car. This may upset family lovers and young audiences. Family lovers. (laughs) So I'll tell Uh, you that violence and gore and profanity are the two that would maybe give it away, I think. The gingers, uh, yep, and the the shred, of course, the lawnmower kill, right. which is super epic. I can't think of anything. Um, yeah, um, I get, I I'm get... gonna guess dead alive. Wrong, no, good no. guess. Though. I, I could see that. It is, a, it is a good guess. Yeah, I'm thinking lawnmower, but the only other one I could think of is um, I will hold it for now. Yeah, it's, it's not that one, probably. Not, <laughs> I, I think, I think not, I know what you mean. It's not sinister, it's not sinister, no. Uh, yeah. Got that place yeah, I can't think of anything. All right, you guys, go. Yeah, uh, uh, Frank and Hooker? Wrong. Uh, so we were talking about the most famous ginger in horror. It was Child's Play 2019. Ah. Uh-huh. Oh, the step, not the stepdad, but the dude. Yeah, that's right. Walls breaks his legs, right? Cool. Nice. Dang it. <laughs> okay. Were you Match picturing the- that scene, Joe? No, I wasn't. I was thinking of a different. I was thinking of a different. I was thinking of like one of the Final Destination movies, but it wasn't a uh, lawnmower. It was like the motor. Like yeah, that's off the back of his head. I think in part one or two. Mm. I can't remember. All right, match the killer to the movie. Let's do it. And tonight we have Winslow Foxworth. What the fuck is that? Uh, is it thirty one? It is not 31. Okay. Well, well your choices are <laughs> uh, limited. I guess I'm going to go Devil's Rejects. Incorrect. It was Richard Brake's character in Three from Hell. Oh, oh, fuck it. that movie. Yeah. Seriously. The newest. The, what was Fly his name? Uh, the Midnight <laughs> Ghost Man or Midnight Wolfman Wolf or something like that? Man, I think. Yeah. I think so. Ugh, that sucked. <laughs> Let me pull up mine. Okay. We have four clues. Clue number one, Sherry Moon Zombie. Oh. Oh. Clue number two, Ken Foray. Oh, uh, wait, Halloween. Incorrect. Because <laughs> no, he uses uh, every single fucking actor. <laughs> the Devil's Reject. Incorrect. Oh, right, now well, we're I back can guess again. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> clue number three, Jeff Daniel Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> It's every Rob Zombie movie. So before, Rob I, Zombie. <laughs> before I give you the, the killer here, because it's going to give it away, let's recap. 
Sherry Moon Zombie, Ken Foray, Jeff Danny Phillips, and clue number four, the final one, be quick, Salem. Lord Salem. Correct. Yes. I had that I in my chamber. I thought you were going to say Bill Mosley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I should have, man. Dang it. <laughs> All right. Guess the movie based off the letterbox reviews. Okay. And as I like to do, they are our reviews. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was hoping this was going to be a so bad it's good type movie, but this was just flat out terrible in every way. I'm offended that I had to sit through almost two hours of this movie. This the is run- definitely Joe. <laughs> yeah. The runtime is ludicrous for this I'm type offended. of movie. I really can't think of one positive thing to say about this movie. The acting story affects quite literally everything that was just absolute <laughs> bottom tier. He's so angry. I love it. I was. I can't remember the movie. He's offended. Though. <laughs> oh my god! All right, Todd. I mean, I'm even, I'm even just telling you guys at this point. <laughs> Typical with these types of films: amazing poster art followed by an ultra cheesy movie. Mm. Post-ups of bloody boobs, mm, cheap-ass like looking toy, and CGI and amateur acting. This was <sighs> fun though, and would be fantastic in a group setting. Mm-hmm. Oh, jeez! Finally, yours truly. I knew the type of film this was going in, so my expectations in the quality of the film were low. But I also hope they have enough fun with it to make it a memorable experience. There are a few scenes that made me laugh at how ridiculous they were, but ultimately, this movie is way too long for its own good. The first half mm-hmm. wasn't terrible, but the second hour was a chore to get through. Less is more with films like this. What could have been an indie gem is unfortunately just another bloated, boring affair. Mm. Um, God. Skin a rink. Wrong. Fuck, I thought I had it with your paws. Dang it. I, I don't know. I fucking, I remember writing that review too. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. You're offended, dude. What offended you? I was, I was offended. I, I, I feel like we, did we, was this a main review? For it the was. pod? Yeah. Oh, dang it. We suck. <laughs> you guys give up? Yeah. Yeah. It is Sharks of the Corn. I ah, had that in right. my fucking <laughs> mind, too. Man. We just mentioned that, like, last week, I think, too. <laughs> That's what we probably made me think of. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dang. All right. I Skin also didn't have bloody boobs. What was I thinking? <laughs> Seriously, yeah, no, they didn't. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I watched walls. the wrong Skin Marine. Didn't yeah. have anything. <laughs> uh, all right. I also have three letterbox reviews. Name the movie. In contention for the worst movie I have ever seen. Without a doubt, the worst shaky cr- cam I have ever witnessed. Seriously, this movie looked like it was filmed with someone juggling the camera. <laughs> Number two. How can you compete with the poetic lines such as you can stick your finger in your dripping twat and finish yourself off? This man 31. has such a way with words. Correct. Yeah, that was my guess. But I didn't want to like. <laughs> yeah. And fine. My last one is why is the Nazi midget speaking Spanish? <laughs> God, that movie sucks. Wow, that movie's fucking rough. <laughs> I saw in the theater too. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, he had a. Uh, he played two Rob Zombie music videos. I was like, get the. Get away. Get over, like, what are we watching? They're like hmm. seven minutes long. You know, I've only seen one Rob Zombie movie in theaters. It was Halloween. I haven't seen any of the other ones. Mm, I s- I've only seen 31 in a theater, actually. We saw, I saw three from Helen theaters. Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. According to the website The Pit, what is Rob Zombie's worst grossing film? Is Ooh. it uh, El Superbiso? Um, so I, I don't think title. I got a theater really, so let me give you a uh, okay. A second guess. Pull again on that. Yeah, um, I would say Lords of Salem. Lords of Salem on the board. I'm gonna go thirty-one. Thirty-one's correct. Eight hundred fifty thousand <laughs> dollars. <Nice. laughs> I thought maybe it'd be a, it was a trick question. It was actually a three from hell. <laughs> that that didn't do well like either. Two, two mil or something like that. Yeah. I, I think Lords of Salem made 1.5, if I remember when I was reading it. <laughs> yeah, 30, uh, oof, 850. All right, finally, guess the movie based off these quotes in the film. So I actually have three of them. 
because I, I didn't pick like more obvious quotes. You know, I'm picking stuff that's a little more deep cut. Quote number one. Hey, how are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this isn't the Republicans versus the Democrats where we're in a whole economically or we're in another war. This is more crucial than that. This is down to the line, folks. This is down to the line. There could be no more divisions amongst the living. Okay. Yeah. This is Don the Dead. Correct. Yep, it is yep. Don the Dead. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, the other two I had was, ain't it a crime? What? The only person who can miss with this gun is the sucker with, sucker the, with bread the bread to buy, to buy it. it. Yeah, that, was my, that was going to be my last one because that was the, the giveaway. Yeah. Last one was, roll the rescue stations. We just got a oh, report yeah, that half those stations have been knocked out. They that get was me tailored nervous. to me, dude. Sure, I'll <laughs> put one out my ass, right? Yeah, I mean, that, I had to do at least one Todd birthday. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that first, that's one of my favorite scenes when the, <laughs> the newscasters and the they're arguing God, with it's, other, su- it's such a good fucking scene. Like, there's so much nuance to that scene, too, mm-hmm. if you like actually pay attention to all the stuff going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And then considering that like none of them are like really, really, really actors, you know what I mean? Yeah. That they they pull it off so well. It's dude, really dude cool. my my favorite one in that scene is that one guy is just like standing there having like a hissy fit and he like throws the papers in the air and yeah. he's like it's like this tall slanky guy. I don't know. Yep. His performance yeah. is like it's really something. Yeah, and Fran breaks um calls Steven the wrong name. Yeah. And they right. it in, and I'm like, wow, in the opening scene. Uh, yeah, of course. Then George A. Romero, of course, appears and yep, and scene. his wife, his wife. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, then it's it's a great. You know, uh, what? we're gonna cover down the dead tonight. Actually, uh, <laughs> yeah, a, memory, yeah. a memory alone again because we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. I want. Yeah, fucking great movie. Uh, all right, so that is Steve and I tied at three piece tonight. Joe with the goose egg, uh, which brings Damn. me in lead twenty. Steve and Joe tied in second place with twelve for quarter. El numero dos. Yeah, making my comeback. I was like five behind two weeks ago. Yeah. Are you guys ready? <laughs> Joe's ready, I guess. Yeah, he's super um, ready. All right. House of a Thousand Corpses, directed by Mr. Rob Zombie from 2003. You'll never get out alive. Two teenage couples traveling across the backwoods of Texas searching for urban legends of serial killers end up as prisoners of a bizarre and sadistic backwater family of serial killers. Starring Sid Haig, Bill Mosley, Sharon Moon Zombie, Karen Black, and so on. Also young Chris Hardwick for the Talking Dead fans out there. A young Rain Wilson for the Office fans out there as well. Uh, yeah, so this movie um, follows four characters. Two men, two girls, as they're traveling across their young college age, things like that. Traveling across the country, set in the 1970s on Halloween Eve. Uh, they come to a gas station, and it happens to be uh, Sid Haig's um, Museum of Monsters and Mad Men, gas, fried chicken, gasoline. And they head inside because it's one of those um, off the wall kind of things like think like Bigfoot Museum, cryptids, things like that, fish boy, mermaid person, stuff like that. He has them all displayed in his little shrine to murder. Um, And he also has a very awesome murder ride in the back where um, one of his cronies pushes a little card around while Sid Haig narrates about famous serial killers and it ends off with the local legend of Dr. Satan, who allegedly participated in mutilating and experimenting on mental patients and they the townspeople rose up and hung them from a tree and of course our kids are like we want to know where the tree is so Sid Haig who plays Captain Spaulding draws them a map and says fine you can go investigate it our kids do and they uh, come across a hitchhiker named Baby Firefly who's played by Sharon Moon Zombie and their car has a flat tire so Baby's like yeah you can just come to my house and we'll hang out and my brother will fix your car they go to the house and I'll stop there so this is a, a film that I probably the most watched film for me in high school. Uh, this came out when I was about a sophomore. So I remember getting the VHS tape and being at a buddy's sleepover and just watching this movie and having a fucking great time. Um, and I've probably seen this one, you know, pushing 20 times now. And there are a ton of like technical issues in this film. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not like blind to them, but I absolutely love it because of the characters, mostly Sid Haig, Bill Mosley, you know, Otis and um, Captain Spaulding. Uh, the entire cast plays their um, their parts extremely well. Um, but I do have beef with our, our our main girls that are the quote unquote victims. I think they're fucking full of shit. And they kind of brought a lot of this upon themselves, which we'll get to later. But yeah, my initial thoughts are I love it. Yeah, I mean, I love that we're doing it. This is also the 20 year anniversary, which is great. It's great to be covering it now. 
I have very fond memories of this movie because I remember hearing that Rob Zombie was going to do a horror movie and like my interest was like instantly peaked. I was like, wow. I was like, that's crazy. And then I remember how, how tough the dis- him getting distribution rights was like this movie did not come out for so many years. And I remember finding like a shitty ass bootleg copy online where you literally couldn't see anything in any of the dark scenes. Cause like, it was just pitch black. It was like a shitty ass cam version. And I watched it though. Cause like, I was just so excited to see the movie. And uh, I mean, I dug the hell out of it and then I was able to actually see it, you know, when it finally did get released a couple of years later. And yeah, I mean, this movie definitely has, I have a lot of nostalgia for it. Is it a Texas Chainsaw Massacre re- uh, like ripoff? Like absolutely, like in a lot of ways, but it's also an homage. So it's like, you know, call it what you want, but he takes things from that movie and he does his own thing with it. You know, the characters are all pretty like unique and original. I think um, he kind of makes his own sort of Sawyer family here and they're great. Like Bill Mosley, fantastic in this. Uh, Sherry Moon, probably her best turn uh in any of the rob zombie movies she just her baby is great like she just played crazy awesome um great you know cast of normal characters as well but obviously all highlighted by sid Haig. he really is the standout here he's just fantastic the opening to this movie is awesome um you know with sid Haig in it and yeah i mean of course there's there's definitely some weird choppy camera and editing choices in here but it has like that grindhouse sort of feel to it. And it worked perfect for this movie. And say what you will about Rob Zombie later on. But this, I think, was probably his, his best movie he ever he's ever done. Um, and yeah, I really dig it. Yeah, I was happy that uh, you picked this, Todd. Because so this is one that you guys had done on Three Guys at Horror. And for a long time, I almost thought that like those movies are almost like untouchable. Like we can't do those because you guys did it. But I mean, they've been erased from existence for years now. So I'm happy that we're re- revisiting some of the kind of bigger ones, you know? And and my my history with this movie. So I, this is the year I graduated from college, which I was in film. And I'll, I remember it vividly. I skipped class because of the DVD release. And my local DVD store was inside a mall. And they were going to give a deck of playing cards from the movie for the first five people who uh, got a copy of this movie. So I skipped class. I went to the uh, like two hours before it's opening to line up to hopefully get one of those deck of cards. And my solo ass waited two hours in a completely empty mall <laughs> until the doors open and not a single other person was there to get that, that, that <laughs> DVD. And that you deck got of him. Cards. I got him. And I still got him you to saw, this day. You saw the deck? Nice. Yeah. And I will say this. Best DVD like Hands menu, down. menu screen in Hands film down. history. Like, they don't make them like this anymore. And I'm actually super fucking bummed that my Blu-ray doesn't have that uh, that menu because it was just Captain Spaulding talking shit to you as if you're in his uh, in his store. And it's just, God, that thing was fucking good. Uh, and I still have it. I still have the DVD as well, but just had to mention that. As for the movie itself, I mean, what can I say? The movie is fucking amazing. I just really love this movie. It's funny because there are a lot of issues if I look at it critically. But for some reason, with this movie, I don't care uh, uh, for a lot of the issues because I have so much fun watching it. It gets very random, especially near the end. But there are so many classic moments in this that I just can't help and smile uh, every time I watch it. It's one I watch, I'd say, every one to two years. Last time I watched it was actually because they had a house of it at Halloween Horror Nights, which was fucking awesome, by the way. Just just really enjoyed that. And yeah, I just love this movie. I mean, my biggest complaint... I'll say it straight up is I think there should have been more Captain Spaulding because he does disappear for a good chunk of the movie there in the middle. But yeah, the, I, I adore this movie. Yeah, back to the DVD menu. It's so good. So good. You hit the little call the ding button, you know, and he's yeah. just yelling at you. And yeah, sad to say, I just got the 20, 20 year like special edition. It's like loaded with like lobby cards and a poster thing like that but the menu fucking sucks they didn't bring back the menu come on you have the best menu of all time and you don't fucking bring it back no it's just it's just a wheel that you click to and it spins i'm like what the fuck is this it's so good that i felt uncomfortable watching it because i felt like captain spaulding was yelling at me (laughs) remember when it first when you first 
put that on you didn't oh expect my it? god yes yes yeah. i do it was it was so <laughs> like it was crazy that was at a time i remember that time vividly because that's when dds are really like getting hot and that's when a lot of movies had interesting menus like they tried to do something with the menus like now they don't just don't give a fuck anymore but at that time and that one was definitely the peak it was just Oh god, it was so hot. and I just sat there watching the fucking menu for it's it's yeah. long too. They filmed like a lot of additional footage for this thing, so and that showed how much of Rob Zombie was a fan of just film and horror. Uh, to do that, you know, to think of I'm gonna film Sid Haig, which is god the best. Uh, just riff for I don't know how long that fucking menu was, but it was long, and I loved it. Yeah, I, they they even have a subsection of them just making jokes about Tiny, like yeah, completely, yeah. Uh, completely separate link you click on it called tiny fuck to stump and it's got <laughs> bill mosley said I, i'm pretty sure baby's in there too and they just tell stories about tiny fucking stumps but um yeah i completely gl- I glossed over that opening scene before we meet the kids too and i i say kids but they're like 20 21 22 something like that but yeah we're introduced to sid Haig, and he's in his clown outfit hanging out his gas station slash murder museum with his buddy and they're just talking I man, I would like to hang out with them. They're so fun. But then these two thieves come in and they have a botched robbery. But I love that scene because like it's very silly, but like there's a lot of legitimately good tension in it. Um, because like the incompetent thieves and uh mixed with Sid Haig constantly yelling at him and like escalating the situation, the music and everything, and then like his line where he's like the the main thief is trying to tell him, like, I'm gonna give you the count of three before I fucking blow your head off, whatever. You go one, fuck your sister, two, fuck, you. and he just keeps going. And then at the end, when he executes him, he's like, "Most of all, fuck you," and he shoots him in the head. And then we get to the title card. I'm like, "Gosh, man, this movie sets it up." How how dedicated is Captain Spaulding to always like go there and make up and like <laughs> run this store like full ass clown outfit and shit? It's for probably like how many people actually go to this gas station? You know, it's uh, a yeah. very dedicated man. Yeah, this movie also get, gave me like lifelong lines that I always say. I always say "shit to bed." Is that part say, two? He doesn't say in this one, all right? Does he? Yeah, no, it's, no, in, no. it's in it's uh, in Devil's Rejects. Son of a bitch! But <laughs> I also always say like "motherfucker got blood all over my brand new clown suit," which I don't have a clown <laughs> suit, but I say it anyway. <laughs> I just man, it's fucking cool. But are you able to separate Dwight from Bill? No, or do you not, see not Dwight anymore. In this movie now. Yeah, like and because he's got the Tough glasses. Now. Yeah, he's got the and I even like in Six Feet Under, he plays a character uh, ca- character called Arthur, and I saw that before I saw The Office, and I still can't see watch Six Feet Under now and not think Dwight. I mean, such an iconic character, you know. It's it's and Chris Hardwick, same thing. You know, I, I watched so much Talking Dead that I it's hard to separate that Talking Dead guy from that movie. It's just crazy that they had two like future, you know, known people. But. And Walton Goggins too. He he blew yeah. up. Be a really big actor. The cop. Yeah, absolutely. Deputy Winston or whatever. No, Deputy Winston's from Cabin Fever. Deputy whatever. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about some. I mean, okay. First of all, not not in 2023's terms, but in 1970s, would you guys pick up Baby Fireflies Hitchhiker? Yes. Why? Because she's hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hot blonde. Yeah, absolutely. She was. She was. I. I... I still don't think I would. I really yeah. don't. As, as hard as she was, like, I just, I would keep driving, I think. Yeah. I don't, yeah. when you're with a group, though, maybe you'd be more willing to do it. But I mean, I know they were like, things weren't as crazy back then, right? Does this movie, they had this a movie ton of place? serial killers in the 70s, too. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, they did. Yeah. People were a lot like let, more trusting then, though. You yeah, know, I don't know. It was weird. I don't know. By myself, absolutely not. With like a, group maybe i'd be more willing follow-up question you're bill and you're getting hit on by baby firefly what do you do i know joe's answer <laughs> nice I, I i i don't play along with it no because i'd no? be so scared i know i'd be so i'd be like i just wouldn't want to deal with the fallout you know what i mean <laughs> after the fact all right so i here, here's where i have beef with our characters and i think obviously i think we all agree where the movie shines is with captain spaulding and baby and all them but my issues with the group of characters like they couldn't be more annoying besides bill like jerry's a fucking annoying little prick mary's a prick i forget the other girl's name she's a prick but like if you look at it at like not a movie right they're driving they have a flat tire they don't know the brother fucking shot it out with a shotgun but they have a flat tire this 
girl offers like, hey, I will fix, my brother will tow you for free, fix your tire for free. And the, the people are still annoyed, like, wait, it's going to take two hours? What? I'm like, bitch, you're in their house. You're taking their hospitality. They're fixing your car for free. And you get free dinner, and they're still talking shit. Is it weird? Do you have to wear Halloween costumes? Absolutely. Is it fucking terrifying that tiny seven feet tall and wearing a mask and got burned because the dad burned them? Absolutely. Is it weird as fuck that baby's dressing up to do a show for, like, her family? And you guys happen to be there? Sure. But at that point in time, until they're kidnapped, they have no reason to be fucking assholes. What are your thoughts? I think I, I yeah, I mean, they're definitely being like very out about it, but I don't blame them for sort of being that way because it those people are fucking shady, man. Like they're shitty as fuck. I'd want to get out of there too, like as fast as humanly possible. So I could I could I get their frustration, obviously. And they're also young, right? So like obviously they're gonna be more like kind of like dickish um would i have acted that way no but i i get it for these characters i think they're assholes <laughs> you know they they kind of deserve what they got uh you know yeah they're, they're really mean in in a lot of ways to the people who are kind of you know you you know you don't know for sure that they're going to be bad people right they could just be an off family um it's not until really otis comes in that it gets bad so yeah i think they're total total dicks and didn't have yeah. the manners you know Plus, Karen Black is like extremely nice to them. I'm, and yeah. she's showing her tits to Jerry, and he's all into it. Hmm. Um, but then, like, they insult them, like making fun of their, you know. At this point, you know, guys, step back. Like, we know they're killers, but they're making fun of their culture and things like that. So, and then, come on, man, baby's doing a show, and she sits on the boyfriend's lap, and you push her off and call her a fucking whore in her house and threaten to. Co- uh, come on, man, fucking Mary. Brooke Spalding even gave them like free fried chicken like on the house complimentary like, fried chicken yeah, yeah. like goddamn, <laughs> he Did, just gave you this big show you know in this tiny little place and you treat him like shit like come on it's fucking ridiculous man mm-hmm. so this was all like do you think spalding like called and tipped them off right i would assume right this was all like a a they setup have, they didn't have like no one once they were there he was like hey baby go like pretend yeah, to hitchhike absolutely. Sort of this, thing. Yeah, yeah this is all yeah the whole setup i sid sid seemed to genuinely like bill though like i got that vibe that he really did like him like there was a good chemistry there yeah but, but i, I mean obviously matters, at the end so. of the day, <laughs> no i know but obviously <laughs> at the end of the day he gave them okay would because you know they went out of their way to find the the um the tree right so do you think if they didn't ask to see the legend or hear more about the legend that sid wouldn't have sent them along their to their death it's a do good they, question. Do you, think, do you think they triggered their own fate by asking about Dr. Satan? I don't know. I mean, maybe, right? But I don't know. I think either way, I think that was an easier way to get to where they, to the final, you know, sort of thing. But had they not, I think still, Baby would have still hitchhiked, you know, down the road somewhere else, you know? Yeah, the question is, like, if they had they gone into, not gone into the museum and all that stuff, like, is oh. that something, you know, is that something? No, yeah, yeah. I, regardless? I, I think if, I think, no, yeah. I think had they not, had they just kept driving, not going to the murder museum, they'd still be alive. But, but maybe not, right? Because it is October 30th and maybe this is like their tradition for Matt Night to do all those like culty, crazy things that they do, you know, near the end of the film. So maybe it, regardless of the fact, you know, if they happened to be going in that direction, maybe it would have been there and it would have still played out the same way as it does in the film. Mm. Yeah, that's a good segue, actually, because I think the first, like, three quarters movie is fantastic. Weird start. It it does lose me a little bit, though, towards this ending here. You know, it gets a little confusing. Like, why are they in rabbit costumes? You know, where exactly? So they can say, run, rabbit, run. (laughs) Right. Well, yeah, it's exactly the reason, right? You know, why? Like, what is happening here? Like, where the fuck do they take them? Like, what the fuck is going on in this underground lair? Like, where are they? Is this, is this like hell? Like, is it like a form of hell that's down there? Like, how do they how do they know about it, first of all? And like, are they taking care of Dr. Satan? Like, are they feeding yeah. these people? Like, are like, like what's going on down there? Like, what and like is it how close to the how close is it to the house? Is it like under the house? And there's there like an underground layer that takes it? I have a lot of questions here. And so, it, honestly, not much, not really any answers either. So you'll have to listen to like the audio commentary 
which I don't know if you want to do, but it's excellent. But originally, um, Grandpa in Hugo, that does his famous fucking comedy routine before Baby, <laughs> the opening act for Baby's Dance, which is fucking full of iconic lines. Um, he was supposed to originally be Dr. Satan. So, and then the whole skunk ape thing where we have flashbacks, that was also part of, part of the plot too, which if it, like, yeah, this movie is confusing as fuck. If you just like, what are they talking about? Like the dumb, the skunk ape had relations with my wife, but no, I take it as um, they're part of the family too. And Dr. Satan, like the legend, everything that Sid Haig told uh, Bill is 100% fact. Like he experimented on people, mental patients. That's why they, they're kind of zombied out because they're mental patients and they're not, they don't have all their faculties. So I think they're, he experiments on them and they have this like underground temple because when he goes into his fucking operating room, it's like a church. Like, so I figure it's just part on the, on their land and they've just been getting away with it for years. Yeah, the movie gets into a pretty weird spot. I don't know if it was really needed to go into the kind of paranormal uh, side of things. I thought they were doing a pretty good job without it. Uh, just having the Firefly family being fucking crazy, you know, doing Fish Boy, of course, with uh, with Bill and doing, um, you know, everything they're doing to the cheerleaders and wearing the fucking dad skin, you know, coming down, which kind of all brings back to the the serial killers that they had talked about you know at the beginning of the film in the on the ride uh, i thought all that was great i was i agree that the paranormal stuff kind of gets a little ridiculous you know they're like zombies at some point and when they're in the uh in the coffin and it's just the whole dr satan thing is kind of a little ridiculous the you know the the priest costume that he has although it looks cool it just it doesn't make a lot of sense but uh i still enjoyed it because it's iconic looking yeah See, I didn't take those those creatures as zombies. I took them as just people that were mutilated, and now they don't know anything, so they fucking I don't know, do their thing down there. Do- but um, Doctor Satan's definitely supernatural, though. He don't look like no fucking human. No, he's he he's in part two. If you go with that, so in like a hospital bed. Uh, I guess like he just it, well, in the first one, he don't look fucking. Well, he's you wearing like a, a yeah. I get it. No, yeah. I, I know what you're gonna say. I'm just trying to defend it. But uh, the, prof- <laughs> the professor too, like, has like an entirety. His entire body is like an open wound, and he's like mm-hmm. spitting out fucking, I don't know, tapioca pudding. That's supposed he's to like, be like, a, like he looks like Bane, sort of. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> no, yeah. And then he, he that's pretty lackluster. That's probably a, a letdown for me. Is like he's chasing her, and then he like hits one beam, and the whole fucking thing collapses on him, and he's dead. I'm like, really? Like he's cool again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a couple notes I took uh, going back to the gas station beginnings. Goddamn, that gas station was amazing. First of all, the decoration there is fantastic. The ride is really cool as well. Something that you know was cool is we got two of the most iconic clowns ever in the same shot. You know, you have of course Captain Spaulding, but you also have the actor who played Twisty in American Horror Story. So then there's a shot of them like in the same frame when they kill the two people. Uh, that robbed the place. So I thought that was cool without, you know, knowing. Uh, it's also interesting that they're watching the monsters knowing where Rob Zombie would eventually uh, get to and stuff like that. Um, but I do want to talk about just, I know we're going back, but the attraction and the gas station. Uh, is that something like horror fans would be fucking flocking to this place if they knew about it? Uh, is that something that would interest you guys? I'm assuming yes, but absolutely. Hell yeah. Definitely. Didn't down. they? Didn't they sort of like recreate it for Halloween Horror Night, Steve? Yeah, yeah, that's basically what they did. Uh, it was really cool too. You start like you know the outside was actually done like the gas station, and you walk in and you got Captain Spaulding, and you know kind of inviting you into the attraction, awesome. and it goes into the it goes into the like the actual ride, then it goes down into the Firefly House, and then it goes into Doctor Satan's Lair. So very cool. That's like, awesome experience. Okay. Yeah. Super cool. I also want to highlight the one scene because like Rob Zombie does do a really good job at times with his use of like music in movies and stuff. And that one scene when the fucking barn doors open when they break in and they see the cheerleaders and it just goes into that sort of uh, I don't even know. It's like a country type song. It just works so yeah, well the there. It's, it's just like so, it's so disturbing but like at the same time like i don't know it's weird it's it just works so fucking well and then just like just like that long fade out shot you know right before he he kills the cop uh, it was great i think i mean it's just it's really great filmmaking and it's like what happened to that rob zombie like later on in his career you know the studio system i think i, yeah. I think 
Yeah, it's like he needs uh, someone to tell him no. That too. That that's a big one. I think he needs a filter to just tell him like no. This Did is anyone cool. tell him no in this movie though? Like I feel like yeah, this Universal was all him. Did. Yeah, exactly. Okay, they, 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 okay. they gave him a ton of fucking problems. He, he this hates movie. this movie because of that. Yeah. Right? He, okay. So. Well, it's probably his best. <laughs> which, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, he does I, need that. Yeah. Yeah, I like when the cops show up though, and like you feel for them, like oh they're fucked because like they split up. Like the the competent officer goes inside with Karen Black, and she can tell she's she you know she has a gun and everything. And the stupid ass deputy starts screaming on the radio to tip him off. Yeah, when I mean, she blows his fucking head off in the room and then executes the cop. Like, all right, you're the you're the cop. You're a gunpoint. Do you give up your firearm? What do you guys think? To fucking Otis. No. <laughs> like. <Fuck> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Just Not after sure, what you right? see in the barn. Yeah. 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 And you already yeah, heard yeah. the gunshot from inside. So, you know, exactly, something's happening. They, they also killed the dad, like, mm-hmm. right there. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. No, just why, why do you think they changed Otis so much from the first movie to the second movie? Because in the first movie, he's so, like, pale and sort of looks not human. But in the second movie, they really changed him up. Like, what, what does Zombie talk about that at all? What What is it called when you've got the white pigmentation? In your skin. He's like Al- albino. albino. There, there it is. Yeah. That, that was intentional, I believe, too. In, in yeah, it's creepy. And then they change. Then he has a completely different look in the second movie. It just know. it's for continuity wise, it just was weird to me. Yeah, that's why. Like, I, I don't, I don't really know. Joe. Like, I think a lot of people think Rejects is like the better film, but I don't agree. I prefer Corpses, and I haven't seen Rejects. And in- see, I, I actually think Rejects is the better film. But I prefer House of a Thousand Corpses, if that makes sense. You know, it does. Uh, yeah, better, better made. You mean? Yeah, a bit better yeah, made yeah. and more polished. Uh, I agree. But I prefer to watch House of a Thousand Corpses, as messy as it is. Um, just another note I took, which I I have to mention before I want to really talk about something: uh, the shirt that Captain Spaulding's wearing when the cops show up. Uh, if I want to listen to an asshole, I'd fart. That's a great fucking shirt. I love that. Doesn't say like pigs are good on the front or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the last thing that we glossed over, and I don't think we should, is that entire show that they put on uh, for you know the the people. God, Grandpa is so goddamn funny in that show. Yeah, he had, he had like the flu too during that filming. Oh, really? Damn. Yeah, and he was. You can even tell he was fucking lights out. But uh, if you, if you watch that, okay. So the setup for the if you guys haven't seen it. They they make them eat dinner together and they tell them the legend of the Doctor Satan, right? But then they have a special program um, where the fire uh, grandpa Firefly and baby do a performance, and they're in this basically like a, a little theater in their house with like um, theater seats that are filled with like what would you call it mannequins that are stuffed and things like that. And then our cast characters are watching Grandpa Firefly do the most obscene comedy routine about going down on your wife and his performance like he screams in the mic and you hit you have microphone feedback and then baby comes out and does a fucking lip syncing dance and <laughs> the girls are wide open mouths like they can't believe what's happening and the guys are fucking super into it Jerry's laughing because he's like I don't know how would you guys react if you're in that like everything up to this point is crazy what do you what do you even do like how do you get out of this I don't know. It's kind of like terrifying, right? Like, I'd be like, man, we're in trouble. But there's literally nothing you can do about it because, like, they literally have your car. There's no way of getting out. So I think you just got to kind of roll with the punches and hope you don't get murdered. And if you do, it becomes fight or fly at that yeah, so point. Don't but... insult them. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You try to be Harry. as nice as humanly possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Try to join them. Like, yeah. yeah. Try, just try to get on. Guys. Them. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah, get up and do stand up next. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, uh, that's kind of what happens in American Gothic, right? One of them kind of integrates with the family. That's that's mm-hmm. what they should have done. They should have tried to integrate it with this family and Motel Hell too. They do that. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So one thing I had in the notes too is like I when when they're leaving in the car, okay, first of all, why go through all the trouble of fixing the fucking car if they're just gonna murder them anyway? And, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then beat the shit out of the car. But what I what I find very funny is that Otis and and Tiny are out on scarecrows. Do they fucking wait out there for like two hours waiting for them to <laughs> fucking leave? What, one, so of my, no. one of my favorite horror tropes is when the killer is just awkwardly waiting somewhere for, <laughs> for like like in screen you know, in, like, in the bathroom dude. stall. <laughs> yeah, just like we, we need to see a movie where the killer is just like essentially waiting there for hours. You know, like Playing what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, like they did in uh, Amazing Spider-Man when he's waiting for Lizard. He's like playing on his phone on a web <laughs> in the sewer. You know, that's kind of what they're doing too. It yeah, no, cool, I mean, they, practical. 
Right. Well, I mean, they they get off on the thrill, the thrill of the chase, just like That's how true. they re- they released them with the with the rabbits, you know, sort of costume, and baby went along and chased after them. They that's that's they like it. They like the thrill. It it gets them off. So that's I think that's why they fix the car, so they can be like, oh, well, they think they're gonna get away, but they're really not, you know. So it all makes it it makes sense for this family. They're fucked up. They like that shit. That makes sense. Uh, favorite kill. Ooh. Um, and fish boys you don't see the death I, but the result was probably oh, wait, most I, iconic i, I, I think jerry i think jerry just oh, the, the play that play that funky music white boy scene yeah. and, you know they get the, they turned on the music it's so raw they've already like kind of scalped them and then they start like fucking kind of torturing him it's pretty disturbing they like cut off his arm and shit that's at one point, bill I think. gets his arm cut off to that song is that bill okay well jerry i think they like scalp him right or something yeah baby, baby scalps him him. jerry no, All right, is Jerry the play that funky music white boy then? No, no that's Bill. Is that Bill? Okay, Bill. Yep. I'm confusing. I'm confusing the two. So then, yeah, Bill the fish boy scene. It's but fun. like lo- the whole like leading up to the the torture of him is is really good. Yeah, he gets it the worst because he's still alive at the end when Doctor Satan is fucking with him. Mm-hmm. Jerry. Um, yeah. My favorite. Yeah. My favorite's pretty tame though. It's the one where Baby runs down Mary and stabs her to death because I really like the lighting in that scene and the amount of blood and just like I. Dude, Sherry, like, to go back to your point, Joe, about what happened to Rob Zombie, what happened to Sherry Moon? Like, she was fantastic in this film, and Rob Zombie's direction was fantastic, and it's just like, geez. I think she was a perfect baby, but uh, other than that, yeah, no. I mean, I thought she was good in Devil's Rejects, too. Like, I thought she was pretty solid. I think those are her two best roles. Then after that, I just, I just think, yeah, I mean, I just think her range isn't great um so yeah i mean i think she can do certain things great that's all and just other things not as well Favorite kill save you said fish boy yeah i also I, don't I, think i think fish boy i also don't think like cherry moon is as bad of an actress as people make her out to be either though i mean there are times she's not the best but i i've some of the fucking screeners and indie Steve movies shaking we his head and, with a dude, disgusting I, look on his face. i've seen some, a lot some, worse some movies man <laughs> she is just like in halloween i think it's two oh god yeah but that's like is it her fault or is it terrible that's that's the thing right but also monsters i didn't think her acting was good her performance her voice like changing pitch constantly was yeah yeah one last thing i want to talk about that i had in my notes so they played a 22 minute version uh, a a version 22 minutes longer with a lot more crazy shit and they played it once at a festival in like argentina or something do you think we'll ever see that version ever again. I don't think zombies ever going to put it out, but I think if we didn't hope. get it for twentieth, I don't know when we would. You know, twenty fifth, and maybe if Scream Factory buys it because they they actively search out deleted material like they did for um, My Bloody Valentine. Uh, apparently, it's crazy. Apparently, there's a lot of like crazy stuff. I mean, uh, so the flashbacks of Baby, you know, she's topless and stuff like that. That all comes from that cut. Um, so I don't know what happened. I I read about it, but. Yeah, I think someone's got to have like a bootleg copy of that somewhere. It, it only played at a festival, so no one, like, I guess people didn't think that wouldn't be the cut, right? It exists somewhere, obviously. Somewhere, yeah. Like someone if, if they play it at a festival, wonder yeah, I'm sure. Univers- yeah, wonder if Universal has it in yeah, a maybe. vault. Yeah, maybe. I'd, I'd love to see uh, that cut, though. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets unearthed one day. But like you said, if it didn't come out for the twentieth, we might not see it till Zombie dies. I don't know, you know. Yeah, it's just, I, I love these like, you know, missing cuts and like Exorcist no, that, Exorcist 3 and uh, Night of the Living that, Dead, the remake and all that stuff. Like, I hope some of these oh, on Earth. Night of the Living Dead remake would be so cool if they finally released it. Yeah, and Exorcist 3, you ever see the fucking screenshots of the stuff that they filmed? No, I haven't. Holy shit, it's like super sick. I, I'll, I'll send you a few pics. It's, yeah. it's sick. Event, Event Horizon too, but they confirmed that that deleted footage is, is, was corrupted. Yeah. So it'll never it will never come out. So that's too bad. Yeah, it is too bad. Hmm. We, we yeah. need to have like a fucking Nicolas Cage type guy, uh, National Treasure, <laughs> but for movie footage that's missing. You know? That that's what we need to make. We'll make that movie like that one that disappointed you guys uh, with uh, Damien in it, where they're looking for uh, like locations. We'll we'll look for missing footage. Oh, on the loca- uh, terror on trips. Terror trips. Yeah, yeah. terror trips. Yeah. So Oof. we'll do one for missing Rough. footage of films. <laughs> All right, are we done? Yep. We, uh, yes, I'll lead off the ratings. I 
want to give this a five star because I love it, but I'll give it a fucking five star. It's five star. I'm leaving it a five oh, star. Man. Even though it's four and a half on Letterbox, I'm putting it at five because I fucking have a lot of fun with it. All right. Awesome. I mean, I I really enjoyed this movie. I enjoyed a lot everything about it. Other than, like I said, that last part gets a little shaky for me and there's definitely some technical stuff there it's still a great movie though i think probably zombies best i give it a four out of five and i'm uh right in the ass crack of both of you um so 4.5 out of five i just can't give it the five because it's it is messy and there are some things about it but that doesn't mean i don't i absolutely love it and i will keep watching it every like year or two uh it's good so 4.5 out of five yeah Rest in peace to rest in peace to a lot of the characters in this film. Tiny, yeah, um, Karen Black, Karen Black, Sid, obviously, Grandpa. Um, yeah, bummer. Yeah, yeah. Sid's the first uh, horror actor I ever met. Really, I, I was one of uh, my wait, first too. I think yeah. I, I was waiting in line to go into my very first like con, and he was just wandering, completely lost, had no idea where the fuck he was going, and I actually stopped him. <laughs> Because, of course, fucking Sid Hag, you know? I was going to the con to see him. So I stopped him, and I, I asked him, what, what you know, what's up? And he's like, uh, do you know where I need to go to get into the building? <laughs> like, yeah, I just, you know, go over there. And then I went to his line first. So super nice guy. Cheap also. Like yeah, a very rare. Bucks. Yeah, actually cared about the fans. Didn't price gouge yeah. everyone. So yeah, Bill Very mostly... bizarre. Very weird signature on Sid had. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote uh, Shit to Bed on mine. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got I, th- I think i have like four signatures from him but um yeah bill mosley like charges like 60 bucks and he's kind of kind of ornery uh, he's what kind of ornery like he's a little little mean sometimes yeah we uh joe and i met him at uh, rock and chalk <laughs> yeah. that's how we got the intro to uh, yeah it wasn't yeah he wasn't not the friend not the, yeah, not the <laughs> no. most, most forthcoming but sid Haig, super fucking nice definitely yeah. oh i met tiny too Oh, nice. oh, did you? Nice. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, he was uh, nice. nice. Right. How about Rufus? He does he some cons. Away. He's a big dude. No, no, not did Rufus. He? I sing, no, I sing it Rufus alive. I sing it. Here you go. Yeah, Rufus is it. No, yeah. I haven't met him yet. And Walton was supposed to do a con, and I was super pumped, but then he canceled. Yeah, he's doing one around here. I've never had the chance to meet him, so I'll probably finally get to meet him. He, he's a good one for sure. And I, I uh, booked a train. I booked two nights at a hotel in another city to meet Rain Wilson. And he canceled the day before the con. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Ouch. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, me and my wife were so fucking bummed. He'd, he'd probably be happy to sign a corpse. Yeah, because he I, probably I signed it's all the office, office, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah. that's actually what I got. I have his office autograph, so I'd probably get a, a corpses. I right, definitely, yeah. definitely would, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, I think that is it for this episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed. Don't forget, next week we are going to be covering Renfield. So let's see how Nicolas Cage does as a vampire. I'm excited for it. Uh, all right. Uh, in the meantime, you can check us out on Discord. Of course, that is the absolute best way. All you can do is send us a DM through any of our socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or the Horror Squad podcast. Just send us a message and we will send you a link to the amazing discord um don't forget to rate us as well if you haven't rated us yet on any of your wherever you listen to your podcast leave us a five-star rating we'd really appreciate it also the horror squad podcast at gmail.com you can email us at any time and i think that's about it and sure so we'll see you guys we got shirts <laughs> oh yes we do we have merch uh tpublic.com slash backslash the horror squad podcast we have a few designs Maybe working on more. I'm sure we will be. Uh, we've been talking about that. So we'll definitely have some more merch coming to you guys soon. And what else? Anything else? Uh, yeah, don't forget to stick around for our interview with By Ling coming up right after this. So we'll see you guys next week. Enjoy the interview with By Ling. Bye. 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 Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horror Squad podcast, where today we are joined by a very special guest, Horror fans will know her from her many roles in the genre, most notably, of course, from The Crow. And today, she is here to talk to us about her latest film, Johnny and Clyde, which is now available VOD. Please welcome Bai Ling. Bai, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Nice to meet all of you and all your fans. I'm very excited. Awesome. Um, So why don't you start off by telling our listeners about your character in Johnny and Clyde and how you got involved in the project. Johnny and Clyde, I want to 
urge all of you to see it because it's so exciting. I'm so excited. So good movie. So entertaining and so crazy. So fun. So much love. So much danger. So much life. So much uh, exposure and so much uh, so much joy there. So I'm I'm personally I haven't seen it. I'm just so excited. It's just because promoting the movie bring me back to the experience when I was shooting it. It was that said it was so magical so fun and the producer directors everybody there just like so focused to do this film to entertain all of you all of our audience how i get involved i think my agent peter and you know the producer of they, they've been working together for a long time so and and he called me he said they want me to be in the movie i said what kind of role he said something you are like you know, they think I'm a little bit, I have this wild craziness. I think perfect fits the role, you know, she's, and I appreciate because normally like assassins, they cast the male characters, male actors to play, but female, I said, yes, it's so excited. So you bring another energy, more dangerous when female go all the way, you know, do this magic. I think I, I have to thank the producer, thank my agent for getting this job. And I, I, I want to work with them more. So I, I really enjoy the process with all the talented people in this film. Yeah, I mean, and you have a great cast here, of course, led by Megan Fox. Um, you know, and Johnny and Clyde themselves, who I thought gave fantastic performances. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your fellow castmates and how was the chemistry and vibe on the set? So Megan, I, I, I always like her as a sexy part. It's very sexy, you know, sort of like a, she's white. I'm Asian, kind of a similar in a way, like very daring and very uh, outrageous going there, very beautiful and talented. So she's like... A, uh, actually, you will not know in the film, I, I actually, even though on screen you say we're together, but I didn't really physically working with her because mostly I work for her as assassin, you know, she gave me orders, but most of I'm on the phone talking to her. But when I was doing looping, I was shooting film in Hong Kong, something I saw on, on the reel, I said, is she there? She's with me. So it's kind of a, in film, it's a magic because it doesn't matter where you are, like, green screens, all of that, eventually they put it together and surprise you. Like uh, like I did the film Sky Captain, World of Tomorrow with Jude Law, I was fighting, right? They put me on this bench, long bench, like, uh, and I was just fighting, I'm standing on top of the, literally not bench, a table, wood table, very long. I was fighting him on the, on the table. And it's just like a look kind of a crappy, right? Nothing fancy. I was fighting with them. When I saw the movie, oh my God, it's galaxy world beneath me, all of that. So that's the magic of this film. Even though I, I shot the film, I did the film, but eventually what's on the film, how magic it looks, I don't know. Therefore, we have to see it on big screen. So um, the other people I work more with, uh, uh, Evan and uh, uh, Ajani, two of them, you know, Basically, I'm the one basically trying to kill them, you know, chasing Johnny and Klein. So this is my big target and my big delicious food, like for my character. So I just aim them and chasing after them, kill every obstacle to find them. And also the director allowed me. I'm so funny. I said, you, you two just ordinary. There's no magic. To me, they're just ordinary people. These two actors look at me. They were laughing. I said, she's crazy. Because I add all these things are talking about magic, ordinary. Because for me, I'm a magic assassin. You're nothing. I can just shoot you. I think anything's a mindset. So they're just allow me. They're just responding. They're just laughing. It's like very natural, very real, these two actors, most I'm working with. So then the rest of all, oh my God, you see my Instagram, I, I am bailing, I just posted a video. I was dancing with a bunch of like 12 guys dressed the same. So funny, I killed them. They're my basically, uh, uh, how do you say, target. But we're together dancing, having fun. Um, I think the, the also I remember more, even though we're doing film with the characters, but I'm more associated with the crew. The directors, the cameraman, we have so many cameras and we have lights and it's night there, daytime, I was in the car. I was dealing with all these behind scenes where people are, you don't really acknowledge. I think they did tremendous job to achieve the look. And also all of us there, I see more of them because I see other, I don't see myself and how dedicated, how, you know, the whole team, like the producer directors, because we're a team, how they conduct, how they, um, manage it, everybody together in the same rhythm and create a look at the film, not just actors. So we're just lucky to have a great team behind us, make us look good, make the film look so fantastically 
uh, delicious and exciting. Now, you've worked on hundreds of movies spanning across all genres, but you always seem to make your way back to the horror genre one way or the other. Um, you know, are, are you a fan of the horror genre in general? And what makes you, you know, always seem to kind of want to return to that genre? That's a good question. I think uh, come to, uh, you know, when something like the food, right? When something tastes good, you want to eat again. So I did the first, I would say it's a dumplings. It's a Hong Kong movie. I won the Asian Academy Award for it. Like four major most important award I won. So it's a horror film, but the, 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 it's a little bit different. It's more like a psychological horror. It's not like it will shock you with some uh, makeup or somebody look like a monster. So psychologically, I think in the horror is extreme of your nightmare. You know, and without nightmare, you cannot appreciate your sweet dreams. So, you know, it's equally important. There is kind of a symphony without a pause. There's no symphony. So it's almost this space of, of wondering, the space of danger that in life or our soul, something we're afraid of. Because you have fear, therefore, you got the gift of how to conquer it, give you reason to be greater. So I think because of that movie, I did the same movie with the same director called Abortionist. So I did another horror genre film that I just doing voiceover for them in Hong Kong called Return Home, opens in July in Hong Kong, all over the world. And it's another extreme, but you know, Asian cinema of horror films is a bit different. They're not shooting, they're not monsters, they're all psychologically very, very beautifully done. So I think it's from Dumplings, if you haven't seen it yet. I just did another film in Taipei. I just finished it literally a few weeks ago. Also kind of horror genre, but it's you trap this building, something happened with a butterfly. But it's more like a drama, more like a beautiful story with a haunting quality. So that's what attracted me, haunting quality of the souls. There's a lot of darkness, a lot of magical in the universe that are, we don't understand because our mind is very limited as a human being. That's what I like about it. Yeah. Uh, so like Joe said, you've been in a lot of great films over the years. Uh, the Crow, Wild Wild West, Samurai Cop 2, which I liked, and Exorcism oh at 60,000 feet. Uh, I loved your performances in all of those. What do you look for in a role when uh, you're picking the movies that you're in? And what are some of your favorites? Um, good questions you guys asking. It's not something I'm looking for. It's, it's the exciting, excitement I want to experience. I'm not looking for anything. I think any role I can play. I mean, one film I played man's role, I just want to share you. I, I, I like the challenge. I like the excitement. I like something that not normally done. In this film I played, the director wanted to cast me to be femme fatale. I said, well, I've done that, just sexy girl somewhere. I said, give me something more interesting. Then they offered the role. The, I said, which character? The character name is Black. I said, Black? Who's Black? So she, he was in the film originally, the biggest gambler, six foot four, you can imagine, uh, a black guy. You know, how am I gonna play that? It's tall, like powerful with all this bodyguard to gamble, she, he wins everything and challenging another tough, dangerous guy. How am I gonna play? The director said, we're gonna add some background change in him. I said, no, you do not change nothing. And then in the film, I said, by the way, my name is Black, why not? You know, I say, you don't have to change anything. So that's challenging. In the end, I'm like so sexy, so alluring, so vulnerable, but most powerful, much more powerful than the physical big guy. I think it's something I'm looking for a challenge. I'm looking for something that excites me, like this role, right? Johnny and Clyde, we have to talk about that. So it's like there's something assessing how you can be funny, how you can find your character that I'm complaining all the time. I give a shit, I don't, I don't like them. I don't like to take the order, but I, they know I do job well, but I have attitude. It's just you add something off the screen, off the character, what's on screen is there. So that's something I'm looking for. And also you said how I coach my character, is that another question? You know, it's funny, it's a magic why I, I'm talking philosophy. Well, I have no question, there's no answer needed. Every time I play role, 
I don't have question. I just knew I can do. I, I knew something that I don't know what it is, but I'm good at it. I knew I'm just excited with energy. I don't know. And I, I give myself quote, if you follow me, I am buying Instagram or real buying Twitter or Facebook. I always have cookies. I think your picture, sexy videos is okay, but I want my audience, my friend, take something meaningful. The quote I gave to myself is, when I'm thinking, I'm an idiot. When I'm not thinking, I'm a genius. So um, I don't have to think. Like this time I'm in, in Taipei, I play some role. She's so much older. She's whole life living in that little street, like old Taipei in that building trap. She owns grocery store. She has a child that's it's, uh, disabled, you know, and she has to survive. She traveled, there's dangers in camp. How I play that? All the details, she smokes, she cannot see well, she's hustling with every, you know, young, old, seducing and doing all kinds of, I never, my life is not like that. It's kind of easy as a movie star in Hollywood. And I jump in and try to cut the next day we're shooting. There's no time for me to, to do any search. And I actually don't need it if you watch Dumpling. I did zero search. I just got there, the director said, I said, what do you want? He said, Violin, as long as you're truthful, have fun. So I just, my, my spirit, I have eight spirit come I want to fail and do this and then just come in any way, just, I was a long take, uh, I just did one long, I was looking at it, I said, this is just magic acting performer. I said, I'm one of the best performer in the world. It's not really bailing, I have to say, it's the universe. When you allow the universe to show their magic through your body, no, you're unstoppable. Even like my character in the Johnny Clyde, unstoppable, she's just having all the force, she just, Basically, if you have joy, the audience will have joy. If you're calculating, trying to do something to make them believe you, then they see the force of performer. So I never learned acting. I don't want to learn. I don't actually have big TV there now. People, my friend gave to me, but never watch. I never really watch TV and movie because I want to keep my mind pure. You know, when it's campus, when it's empty, then you can paint anything. And also it's a computer. We don't have, pro I don't have any program. I don't have apps. When it's coming in, it just runs so fast. So I keep my mind very simple, very real. I, I enjoy real life, real people, strangers. I talk to them. That's how you capture the real emotions when you go through, you remember. It's like a chips. You remember when you play character, you just somehow know. So that's how I think, uh, of course, um, I, I did a movie, Red Corner, you see, right? I want to, National Border Review Breakthrough Performance. I should have won Oscar, but I was so new. Uh, and, and one of the best coaches in Hollywood, somehow I met him, I was doing press junket. He said, Biden, I want to tell something, tell you something. Mary Strip, it's a master of what she does in acting as an actress. You are, a, a, you are a, an original. I didn't understand that. I was like, what's original? What's he said, Biden is a great compliment. You should take it. I said, original. Okay. Then I figure out it's like a child, you know, when child on screen always take over because they're so real. They're crying, they're laughing, their emotion are, are very honest. So I, I as a performer, I want to, I'm so honest. Like before they say, talking to journalists, you cannot, you cannot be honest. They're gonna twist it all up. I said, no, no, no. I said, I want to be honest, whatever in the end people, you will see through the light and honesty and who you are. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was, what a fantastic answer. And by, unfortunately, our time is running short. You were an absolute pleasure to talk to today though. Everyone, of course, make sure to go check out Johnny and Clyde. Uh, it's now available uh, video on demand. Uh, bye. Before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to, you know, promote or any other films yes, or projects yes, you have coming yes. up that we can check out? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. Of so, course. Um, if you go to my I am Bailin, go click the link on my bio, go find me because I'm so proudly uh, uh, present my movie. I made myself direct debut director. Debut, di director debuted a film called My Quarantine Romance with toilet paper. So I, I, I financed it, I write it, I direct it, I star in it. I have like uh, 23 big cast members. It's a 118 minutes film. I also, I wrote 11 songs in it and music, I composed. Who composed music as a director? Only Charlie Chaplin. Also, I turned myself into Charlie Chaplin in the movie. It's a fantastic, it's a comedy. It's same energy, but it's so funny. It's like a roller coaster. I think I'm like a female Quentin Tarantino. I'm sorry to say that, but I, that's how I feel. It's a tendon also from universe. It's so funny. It's like a 
13 people visit me when I was trapped in the quarantine to give me toilet paper to, in, in exchange for sex and love. But more for profoundly, it's like, when we don't know what's happening tomorrow, what do we want? What do we really want? What's really meaningful? So this is my love letter to the world, to, to the, our history, our time, because it's the only movie that can then conceive and film it during that time in the most dangerous heights of the COVID. So that's something I really want to uh, dedicate to all of you. I know it's gonna go viral. After that, I'm gonna bring to Broadway. I have a big dream. So hope you can support me, click there. Even a little bit will be great help because it's my love for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye. We, we will definitely support you. Everyone make sure to go check out Byling's Instagram, her website, everything. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank one last thing. Go yeah, see thank, thank Johnny you, and Klein because you will laugh. You want to watch it again. It's a such a hip, modern and kind of a really, really, really exciting and a magic movie. You're going to watch it. Watch awesome. me while I shoot you. Thank you very much. Bye. An absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.